We have gathered on this notable day to celebrate the life and honor the legacy of a lady whom we all loved and admired, Charlotte Slaughter. Born on Sunday, November the 3rd, 1946, to the late Leroy and Vivian Force, Charlotte was their second girl, the middle child to be exact, born between her older sister Frances who has gone on to her reward and her younger sister Janice. When Charlotte was about 18 years old, she was dating a friend of Johnny's. And this friend was serving in the military and um, like a good soldier, he always followed orders. And so when he was recalled to go back to serve his country, Brother Johnny started making his move. He told me he started talking to Charlotte and he found out pretty quick that she wasn't in love with that other guy. So he started talking to her some more. And within eight to 10 months, they were married. And for almost 56 years, they never left each other's side. Together, they built a family, a home, and a life that they were very proud of. The first to grace their world was Chris, who was married to Brandy. The second was Keith, and lastly but not least was Rebecca, who was married to Chad. And I can tell you from personal experience that there was never a dull moment around the Slaughter household. Rebecca, I'm pretty sure Keith and Chris still owe you some apologies. From these three children, Johnny and Charlotte were blessed with 11 grandkids, Ariel, Skyler, and Chaz, Blaine, Carissa, and Jonathan, Zachary, Tyne, and Tori, Tana, and Tripp. Your nanny loved you deeply and dearly. And from this group, Charlotte was blessed with four great grandkids, Camden, Aiden, Stetson, and Aubrey, brightened her world with a special radiance. And I'm sure that she never missed an opportunity to shower them with great affection. Charlotte Slaughter was a loving and caring lady she had a way of making you feel like family, even if you weren't. 
growing up around the slaughters, I always assumed that we were cousins. And uh, Keith and I used to tell our friends at school that we were. I suppose because we both had Ronnie as an uncle, we just figured that that made us cousins. If I was kin to one slaughter, then I was kin to all of them. And um, so it was kind of a strange day when I realized that we were really on opposite sides of that connection. But it didn't really matter. I continued to hang around their house and eat their groceries anyway. And uh, I was always at Keith's house or he was always at mine. I can tell you that I've rolled and wrestled in the dirt on Norman Circle more times than I can count. I still see Sister Charlotte stick her head out the front door of that house and uh, tell Keith and I to settle down before one of us got mad or hurt. She was probably too late for that. One time, Keith and I decided to build an underground hideout in the back field of their house. For the Johnny never even fussed at us about it. He just came home and acted like it was the best thing in the world, I guess. I don't remember getting in trouble for it. We dug this deep hole and we put bracing and plywood over the top and we covered it with dirt. And that remains to this day one of my favorite boyhood memories and one of my all-time favorite forts that I ever built. In those days, Keith could eat like a horse, and uh, I, that probably hasn't changed much, but he's still fit as a fiddle as he's always been. But um, we could have just eaten an hour or so before, and he would come into the kitchen wanting something, and he would say, Mom, Murray's hungry. And I would look around, and Sister Charlotte being wise and to his ways, she would say, Keith, Murray can have whatever he wants, but you stay out of the kitchen. And uh, she was smarter than us. Time separated us for many years, but I've always held this family in high regard. No, we're not cousins, but to this day, I still count Chris, Keith, and Rebecca, Brother Johnny, Sister Charlotte, as family. And I know your mom is proud of you all. Brother Johnny, you've been an exemplary husband. Your faithfulness to this precious lady has not gone unnoticed by anyone. And I know your heart is broken today. And I'm not sure that I could really say anything that will make the pain go away anytime soon. I know that the last many days that you have agonized over not being able to be in the room with her, and you feel that you should have done more and perhaps could have done more, and we all feel that way. But don't ever forget that you gave her the very best thing. You loved her. And with her last breath, I have no doubt that from you, from her children, her grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and all of her loved ones and extended family, she felt that love from all of you. Last Monday, January the 18th, 2021, she drew her last breath here on earth, but the very next one she drew in heaven. Today, she is more alive than she's ever been. And may I say that you didn't lose her. Something's only lost if you don't know where it is. But we know where she is. And today, she's home. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. I'm honored this afternoon to read to you a letter from Brother Harold and Sister Harold, who were Sister Charlotte's pastors for most of the years that, uh, well, for 40 years probably. And Brother Harold expresses his deep regret for not being able to be here with you today, but sent me a letter and it's my privilege to read it to you from them. Our hearts are sad and grieving today because of the loss of Charlotte Slaughter. On the other hand, there is peace and joy at the thought of her going home. We grieve, but not as others who have no hope. And so we celebrate the home going of a dear and precious lady. So many of her loved ones, peers, and friends have already gone on. Charlotte remained here with her frailness and weakness. She remained here with her frailness and weakness. It reminds me of Noah 
being shut in on the ark seven days before the flood. The flood would be his deliverance. And for whatever reason, God shut him in seven days before the flood came. It seems like that sometimes happens to God's children. They are shut in with sickness, weakness, and frailty before they cross over to the other side. We wonder why, and we try to guess, but we don't really know. We just have to trust God. So Charlotte has gone home. She is with an innumerable company of angels. She is with the multitude of God's children, which no man can number. She is home with so many loved ones and friends. Johnny, I'm thinking of a poem as I write this. Charlotte, we shall find you there where our low life heightens, where the door again unbars, where the old love lures and the old fire whitens and the stars behind the stars. Let's pray together. Master, we love you today and we thank you for the great grace of God that we feel in this house. And I pray for every heart here this afternoon that you would apply the balm of Gilead and soothe our sore hearts. Strengthen us and comfort us, I pray. Be with us and guide us through the days to come. Walk with Brother Johnny, Chris, Rebecca, Keith and their families, her extended families, her loved ones. Keep them near and draw them close. Cause your face to shine continually upon them. Strengthen them. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen.
I was um, thinking today that going back in my mind as I've recounted the last year or so, today is the 22nd funeral that I have conducted in less than a year. 12 of those counting today have been people that I have known and that are a part of this church and have been a part of it for many, many years. And I must confess to you this afternoon that it doesn't get any easier. But I do feel the presence of the Lord and I feel the strength of the Lord today and I'm so thankful that in times like these we know who the great shepherd is. I want to read a scripture that may sound perhaps a little strange at a funeral, but I find it fitting for this precious lady and this occasion. In Numbers chapter 17, there are two verses, verse 7 and 8, that stand out to me today. The Bible said, And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. One of the things that Sister Charlotte loved doing was to work in her garden and her flower beds. She loved to see things grow, to watch them spring to life. Only someone with a sense of godly concern and care can exhibit such grace and patience. To trust that what has been planted into the ground will soon burst forth with new life. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is divine. Upon the backdrop of a great plague which had fallen upon the people of God, we are introduced to the first and, as far as I can tell, the only floral miracle within the Bible. In setting forth a promise of hope, the Lord instructed Moses to take a rod from each leader of the tribes of Israel and to place them in the tabernacle. God was going to set an eternal seal upon one of these old and dry sticks. In the morning, a sign would appear upon one of them that would erase any doubt as to whom God had placed his approval and his anointing upon to minister to the house of Israel. And so it was when Moses returned to the tabernacle of witness on the morning, uh, he witnessed a miracle that had not happened before and that to my knowledge has not happened since. Aaron's rod budded. The Bible said that it brought forth buds and blossoms and that it yielded almonds. The almond tree and its fruit play a significant and symbolic role within the narrative of redemption. God created it in such a way that it actually reveals its blossoms before its leaves appear. And it is no wonder then that its Hebrew name means to awaken early. For the almond tree bears its blossoms in the midst of winter on a barren leafless stem and these blossoms that are reddish or flesh-colored in the beginning seem at the time of their falling exactly like white snowflakes. One day, Aaron's rod seemed like nothing more than a dry old stick, but upon the dawn of the next, it budded and bloomed and produced fruit all at the same time. What seemed like a thing that had long since served its time was suddenly alive with renewed purpose and power. What a miracle. Aaron's rod, in its renewed condition, pointed Israel to a day of restoration, of redemption, and of revival. Touched by divine hands, it revealed their significance and perennial value, what they meant to the great husbandman above. From that one who said of his own garden, I, the Lord, do water it moment by moment, Hope sprang up out of despair and death. To behold this rod that budded sent a message from above that said, I will bring new life and new beauty to an arid and dying world. Over the past many years, it may have looked as if Charlotte's life was in decline, and indeed 
it was physically. Yet every day her inward man was being renewed. Every day it was budding and blossoming and it was bringing forth fruit. Every day she was struggling on the outside, but she was budding on the inside. She was bound on the outside, but blossoming within. She couldn't really get out and do much and go like she once did, but I'm sure she often felt as if she wasn't doing anyone much good at all, but she was being fruitful in ways that we cannot even begin to understand here today. Charlotte Slaughter, she was a rarity among us, a lily among thorns, the fairest of 10,000. What a precious lady. So many people go to the house of God and they experience the same set of circumstances that everybody else experiences. They sing, they listen to the sermon, they pray just like everybody else does, but 11 out of 12 will go home and still be the same never having been changed. Like those old 12 rods that were placed in the tabernacle, they experienced the same presence and potential, but only one of them ever sees any real change. And that one, like Charlotte, allows the word to spring up within her soul, and she buds, and she blossoms, and she brings forth fruit. Today, the grim ghosts of her past are laid to rest. The dread of tomorrow has forever vanished. The crooked has been made straight. The rough place is plain. Heaven has come down to greet her soul. Glory has forever crowned the mercy seat. An ancient transformation has been reenacted in her life. She has blooded or budded and blossomed and yielded almonds. I want you to look closely once again as God sets her in that heavenly tabernacle. And think about it in closing with me here this afternoon. She has budded. She's alive. We see death here, but she's alive. Never ceases to amaze me how our thinking is often so wrong about such moments as this, especially when it comes to one of God's children. We have convinced ourselves that we are traveling toward the sunset of our life, the end of a long day, seeing the enveloping of darkness. But for the child of God, that's not how it is at all. In fact, we are traveling toward the sunrise, that new day that never ends. We're not in the land of the living, traveling to the land of the dying. On the contrary, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the land of the dying, and we are traveling to the land of the living. On the heels of that great plague, that has befallen humanity, Charlotte Slaughter is alive forevermore. She has bloomed. As beautiful as she was in this life, she is clothed with a beauty whose radiance will never fade. No wonder the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Look around this room today, her life here, you recognize it, you see it, you remember it. It was marked with sweetness and grace. And in that realm wherein she now journeys, such beauty will never dissipate. I submit today that she has not passed her purpose. It has only just begun. She has yielded fruit. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I have chosen you, that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Look around this room today and you'll see the fruits of her labors. 74 years in this world and not a moment of them was wasted. She invested, she loved, she cared, she provided for, she covered you with prayer and today she is alive. And that legacy lives on and her influence lingers long into your futures. Her life continues to produce through your lives. Her words resonate through you and within you, and her gracious deeds are reflected in you. She has budded, she has blossomed, and she has yielded her fruit. Life, beauty, and bountifulness. These constitute and crown life's unanswerable 
argument. Let me read a few words of scripture to you, said the chaplain to the dying soldier on the battlefield. No, I'm thirsty. And so the chaplain arose and brought him some water. Now may I read, he inquired. No, I'm cold, the dying soldier said. The chaplain quickly took off his own coat and wrapped the young man tightly within it. I'll read a word or two to you now, the chaplain said. Not now, preacher, said the young man. I'm tired. And so the pastor, the preacher said, then use my lap for a pillow and try to get some rest. The young man closed his eyes and he rested for just a few moments. And when he opened them he, again, he looked up and he said, Padre, if there is anything in that book that will make one man behave toward another man as you have behaved toward me, then by all means, please read it to me. In the chaplain's patience, sympathy, and devotion, the dying man caught a glimpse of the buds, the blossoms, and the almonds. And convinced by that argument, his heart was won. And if you have seen anything in Charlotte Slaughter's life, you have seen the gift and the grace of God that brings salvation to all men. And may it serve to lead you to him as it did to her many years ago. May the Lord bless you today. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this precious lady. We don't want to let her go. We don't want to say goodbye. Our hearts are heavy and broken. Our tears are real. And they're right now. And I pray that you would bring comfort and peace to this family. Walk with them as they go through the valley of the shadow of death. It seems to end abruptly at a grave, but remind us one more time that it doesn't. It simply ends at a doorway into that world that is to come. And may we all strive to live our lives as she did holding to your word. Thou dearest friend I've ever known, thy constancy I've tried, you teaching me the way to live. You taught me how to die. May that word of God that lighted her path lead us and guide us and comfort us in the days to come. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen.